Okay. Thank you. Better? Oh. Hello, everybody. Hi. How's your lunch? What's good? Um, don't think so. Was the lunch good? Yes. Okay, that's better. All right, so are we ready? Okay. Well, thank you all for being here again this morning, I mean this afternoon, and uh, yesterday it was a uh, good evening, and uh, the whole day was amazing, and I just want to say thanks again for having me here, and uh, it's been a great experience, and uh, you know, I, uh, I'm very grateful to be here. Thank you, and uh, um, I just want to get some uh, hands up for the people who were here yesterday uh, on my talk. Anybody? A few? Mm. Oh, you guys were here. All right. Well, that's okay. Still, you're still going to hear the same thing. <laughs> Unless if you don't, you're not interested anymore. Are you? No? Okay. I still see people coming in, so I'm just kind of like uh, running around the bush until everybody's here. Or maybe I should start. I have a passage on my book that I just want to read to you before I start my talking. And um, for some of you who haven't got a chance to get the book, this might be able to give you the, the, the insurance to get the book. Um, this uh, passage is actually um, it's a belief from my grandmother, and it's a dream also. So are we ready? You ready to hear it? For some of you who have read the book, I'm sure you, you already passed that part, but I'm going to read it anyway. <clears throat> palm oil is a vegetable oil that comes from the palm tree. It's deep orange in color, and in Sierra Leone, we use it to cook most of our food. Whenever you dream of palm oil, my grandmother, to my grandmother told me, had told me, when I was um, seven, blood was spilled by the end of the day. I dreamed a lot about palm oil when I was growing up. And sure enough, whenever I did, I would cut myself playing tag with my friends or scraping my knee. But on our first night in Mangara, it's a tiny village, I had my worst palm oil dream ever about palm oil. I was standing in a pit, in a big pit, in the ground. It was full of palm oil, which came up to my knees. Beside the pit stood the tiny drum we kept full of fresh water, uh, lake water for the family. The wooden legs that held up the, the drum were on fire. The water inside was boiling. Steam rose from the, dreams, the, the drum spout into the clear blue sky. The wooden legs began to swing, and the drum kneeled over. As it fell, the drum turned into my head. In the dream, there was no water inside, only palm oil. And as my head fell to the ground, the thick oil coached my body from head to toe. I woke up screaming. I had been sleeping on the floor on a straw mat beside Adamsi. There were about 15 of us in the room, including my f the family who, hun who earned the hut, Mary and Ali, Adamsi, Muhammad, and Ibrahim. It was very early in the morning. The sun was just beginning to show through the window on the other side of the room. My scream woke Ali. 
As he glanced at me, I began to shake. I knew he would be angry at me for making a noise. We had been told we would know when the rebels were coming, were getting close because we, we would hear gunshots. That's why we had to be very quiet. I was afraid Ali would beat me because my scream had been so loud. Ali was a big man. When kids don't do, didn't do what he asked, he liked to show how strong he is. He was by grabbing a tamalangpa tama beating, and beating us hard. Mary slept soundly beside him as my uncle's piercing brown eyes burned right into me. I worried. I was about to get it. Then someone else in the room stared. Try to be quiet, Ali insists. You will get us all killed if you don't. He glanced at me again, then lied his head back down on, the on his mat. I breathed a sigh of relief and swiped the sweat from my head, my brow. The room was already getting hurt. I rolled up my mat and, some and smoothed out the curtain dress I slept in and went outside to see who was awake. I didn't tell anybody about my dream, my bad dream. At least not right away. Once I, had, I have had a look around, I followed a woman in the, I didn't know, to the nearby river. After I washed my face, ran down, sorry, the book is just a little bit, ran down some water over my braided short hair. I brushed my teeth with a chewing stick, which was just a twig from a tree. I began helping her wash, it, wash clothes. I was carrying a plastic jug of water back to the village. When Ali approached me, I thought, oh no, this is it. I'm in for my bidding. Instead, he said, he needed us to, me to go and get some food from, the, the, from a guru. I wasn't sure enough. I wasn't sure I heard. I had heard him correctly. So I politely asked him, what is it you want me to do? I want you to go to Magbaru with Adam Say, Ibrahim, and Muhammad and get some food from the storage bin. He said, I was shocked. I stood absolutely still as a droplet of water from the jug on my head drip drip down my face and back. What kind of a man sent children back to a village that rebels are about to attack? I thought to myself, there are some others going with you. Ali pressed on. Some men from Mangarama, you will be safe with them. The image from my, head, from my dream flooded back. I did something children are never supposed to do in Sierra Leone. I looked Ali an elder straight in the eyes. I then went forward further and did something that was almost certain to result in a beating. I spoke back to him with a confidence I didn't know I, I had. I replied, no, I'm not going. I don't want to go. I decided to lie and said I wasn't feeling well. You have been washing clothes. I saw you by the river, and now you are fetching water, Ali said. You are not sick. You go to Magbaru and get the food from your, with your cousins. I am not going anywhere today, I insisted. Shaking from head to toe, I told Ali about my dream and my grandmother's prediction. Something is going to happen, and it's very bad today, I said. It will be bad, and if you don't believe me, I will go, but we might never see each other again. I thought he would yet yell at me, but, but he toggled. Just go. I am sure nothing is going to happen. 
I walked back to the house where we had slept and set the water jug down beside Marie. Begin to cry. And she too told me, you have to go. You must go. There's nothing to worry about. She reassured me. The rebels have never come yet. I am beginning to think that they are not even real. So do what Ali said, ask you. Go to Magbaru. I was still crying as I left Mangarma with Adam, Say Ibrahim, and Muhammad. All I could think about was my dream, the palm oil, the burning water, the burning water drum, and my grandmother's prediction words. Whenever you dream of palm oil, blood will spill at the end of the day. Thank you. Um, Okay, sorry, just a little passage that I just wanted to share with you guys. And um, so this is a passage in the book, which uh, a dream from my uh, grandmother, uh, a prediction that she used to tell me. And so, um, you know, and sure enough, as I said, it used to happen. And um, I came from a very tiny country called Sierra Leone, West Africa. <clears throat> Sierra Leone is supposed to be one of the richest African countries, but because of corruption, it's one of the poorest countries in the world. And uh, it's been engaged in 11 years civil war since 1991 to 2001, I believe. Hmm. So anyway, it's been 11 years civil war and horrible war. When the war started, well, of course, I was, a child, I was a little girl. I didn't know anything. And the war didn't start in our side, where it started far away from our side. And so um, by the time it came closer to us, we started realizing the elders of the village started knowing that this is coming to serious. And uh, sometimes we have to be advised to leave the village, to go to the bushes. We slept in the bushes for as many as we, we could, like uh, days, weeks, maybe even a month. And so um, it was coming, coming, it was kind of like uh, a fun to us for the children. You know, we, all we know was playing. We didn't know what really a war was. And so until when it finally get to our side, closer to nearby our village, when the, the rebels attack there and then we have to flee from our village to another village where now we um, we've went there for safety. But it was the wrong choice we did. And so being in this village where I read in the, the book, Mangarma, it's called Mangarma, it's a, a small village, but there was uh, so many people were there, uh, more than two or even 300 people gathering there, less than maybe 20 houses. And so, um, after three days later, <clears throat> the rebels actually attacked that village. And so when they attacked, as I mentioned, I wasn't in the village. My three cousins and, and I were sent to the other, our village to get the food from the storage bin. And so by the time we came back, we found out that the rebels were already took over the village, captured so many people, burned houses, destroyed everything. And so we, we were captured, and my cousins and I were captured. And so um, our hands were tied in our back, and uh, you know, we were taken to separate places. And so we thought, you know, everybody was gone, so we didn't know that we were gonna still see each other at the end of the day. And so not knowing that the rebels have different plans for us, and so um, I witnessed the brutality while the rebels were torturing many members of the village, children, young, old, pregnant women, oh, babies, so terrible stuff. All those things are not the worst thing I, I experienced in my life. It was the worst thing was when I witnessed the my uh, two best friend was locked in a house with more than 40 people in this one tiny house and they were born to life and uh, you know just they scream and uh, still you know flooding on my head uh, my mind up to today you know shouting for help and uh, you know there was no help so um, it was terrible and so at the end of the day after I witnessed all the people were killed in front of me because I have to watch because you don't have a choice. I was hopeless sitting there doing can't say or do anything. 
hungry and I couldn't even think of hunger or even to be uh, water to drink. There's no water, no food, no nothing the whole day. And so at the end of the day, I was handed over to four boys who were not much older than I was and uh, who took me to a spot where they asked me to put down my hands to cut them off. And this time I was, uh, it was April, going to May when I was going to turn 11, actually. Um, Yes, so, um, so they took me to a spot and asked me to choose my punishment. I said, well, I don't have a choice. I choose to stay alive. And they said, no, we can't leave you to go like that without any mark on your body. So I said, well, I don't know what else. So um, they decided to put down my hands while the other one was using the machete and chop them off. The other one was pointing the guns, the three of them pointing the gun on my uh, my, my whole body side gathering around me. And so, um, so after that, I passed out for several seconds. After I regained consciousness, I found the whole village was on fire and there was no body to be found. And so I stumbled to the bush where I spent a night alone. And uh, I, the next morning, I was surprisingly that I was still alive. And I managed to walk and I find a village where I was taken to the hospital in Freetown because I didn't want to give up when I lay down there. My life was still there and I was still able to walk. And I met a man who helped me halfway and also offered me a mango. And if you may ask why the book is called The Bite of the Mango, that's how the, the, the title came along because the mango kind of helped me to regain my strength to be able to walk. And so I was taken to the hospital and received treatment there. And then after I was sent to the a camp, a refugee camp in a suburb of Freetown in Aberdeen, the camp was filled. It was uh, filled with diseases, dirty, and all sorts of crimes and all sorts of things, that bad things that you can think of. And so um, I, was, uh, I was there for almost three years and the camp was a hell. When I said hell, this is the time when uh, my three cousins also reunite in the hospital. We found ourselves, all of us, our hands were cut off. Four cousins, I can't remember, I can't even imagine how that happened, but yeah, so for two boys and two girls. And so all of us were moved to the Apinti camp in the camp. And so we have to turn ourselves in the city of Freetown to beg for our survival, food, clothing, all type of things, you name it. And uh, you know, this time there's no shame. I didn't want to do that, but I didn't have a choice. Either you do it or you starve to death. And as I was saying, there was so many uh, help coming in in the country. And, uh, you know, but it's just because of those corrupt people were on top of everything. And so, of course, the minority, uh, minorities, which is us, the, the, the one behind, we suffer the most. And, uh, you know, they get the best things and we get nothing. And so we have to beg. And so, uh, during this time, I also joined a theater group in the camp that helped me now to regain my, uh, my faith again in God because I remember there was a time in the camp, I know, I felt, sometimes I felt like ending my life because of the thoughts of going through life without my, the use of my hands. And, uh, but my family also were in the camp and the theater group helped me to heal and to look forward to the future with hope and positive, with positive mind. And so I was able to survive. And finally, I get the opportunity to come to Canada in 2003 when uh, this uh, wonderful boy, it was just a boy, who um, find my, uh, who his dad found my uh, story on a newspaper in Canada. And uh, he asked his dad, so to do this favor for him to bring me, uh, bring this little girl from this country to Canada to get a better life, and that's how I get to Canada. And when I get to Canada, things were different. I thought uh, from going from Freetown to my village. No, it's not it. It's a whole world. Canada is a whole world. I didn't know that when I get to the airport, I'm like, okay, where am I? I was lost. I don't know where I was. And so it was, uh, it was a challenge for me. I didn't know a word of English. I never been to school. And uh, this is like a strange country. I didn't have any family there. And it was just 
it's horrible for me. And but uh, with my determination and uh, you know and hope and faith and positive attitude, I was managed to survive and uh, you know to try to make a positive use of my uh, my situation. And so I started ESL as a, uh, ESL. Uh, English as a second language and after six months later I was able to pick up a few words of English and able to write my name and spell it out and all that and so I was sent after six months later I was sent to high school it was a hell I thought it was fun but I was determined because I wanted to learn uh, the English I wanted to go to school I wanted to know what the education was and so I was managed uh, it was a rough journey for me but I was willing to do that and uh, I went there with a positive mind and I didn't want to give up I didn't want to uh, just lie there and be um, dependent for the rest of my life so I, uh, I graduated from high school after four years later and um, you know and uh, when I graduated I started college but the, what I started first I didn't like it and so I keep changing 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 and so um, until I met my friend who now who helped me to so who convinced me actually to write my story on a book and so we it took us a year to finish the book and uh, it was uh, another journey for me to go back and reaccount all the things that happened and uh, was able to get every single thing right. Well, some things maybe it's, uh, I, uh, maybe I overlap, but, um, and uh, so after a year later, the book came out and uh, I was named um, as a UNICEF special representative for children in armed conflict and uh, you know and so it's been it's been a positive journey for me and the book has been uh, all over the world I have to say it's been translated to several uh, languages around the world and um, and uh, it's been like a a journey and that I have traveled alone with uh, good people along the way. I, I met a very wonderful family in Canada who took me in and uh, treated me as their own and they were just so beautiful to me and, and wonderful and I'm so grateful and uh, you know and the book, when the book came out I started doing uh, talks talking about my story and about the book, promoting the book. And uh, whenever I go to talks, I have so many questions. And, uh, but there's only two questions that stick on my mind, which I use, to, I use them now to uh, talk to other people. And uh, first, the question that I'm going to share with you is, um, there's uh, this little boy who asked me, well, what do you feel about the rebels? Who cut off your hands? Would you ever? Uh, think the feel the need to revenge. I said, no. I said I do not feel the need to revenge. I said, um, and I didn't know that I have I, I ever have that you know confidence to say to use that word. I just said, no. I do not need the feel the need to revenge. That is not my place. My place right now is to forgive and move forward because. One said, an eye for an eye will make the whole world go blind. I said, so I do not want to live in a blind world. I said, so, because if somebody do you something and do it back, it's not going to be any better. It's not going to be any peace. I want peace. I want to live to use my story and inspire other people. I said, so I do not feel, need the, feel the need to revenge. That is not my place. My place right now to look forward to the future with hope. And also, there's uh, other question which uh, this uh, lady asked me, um, said, well, what do you feel towards God regarding, uh, you, regarding your condition as an RPNC for God to letting this thing happen to you? Then I said, perhaps God took away my hand so I can touch the world with my heart. And I try to do so every single time I have the opportunity to stand before you and talk to people because there are so many thousands of people, of victims around the world who do not have the opportunity and I do not, have, I do not know that I have this confidence to stand before you and share my story. But I feel 
privilege and uh, now I have the opportunity to share my story, not just my story, but the story of millions of people out there in Sierra Leone, those kids who were, their hands were cut off, their feet were cut off and lost their parents. Some of them are still suffering today. And so those are the stories that I'm working around and telling people because I want you guys to hear it. And uh, I, I believe that whatever I say here, I said here today, will make a difference to you. You go home and tell your friends or your family and share it to your neighbor and, uh, you know, and make a difference. And, uh, you know, and we're going to, how many minutes do we have? 10? 20? All right, okay. So, yeah, so as I, uh, I was saying, so I hope that my story will make a difference in your life or somebody else's life. So that's why I really encourage you to read the book because um, this book, it's not about the sale, okay? It's about what's inside it. I want you to get something because there, I have so many reviews from this book about young, from young people, old people, people with disabilities, just to say, oh, thank you, Maria, for sharing your book. Now you opened the door for me to tell my own story. I never knew that, knew that I was going to be able to tell my story. But this book is it's too powerful. I'm telling you, it's not just about my story. And I encourage you to get it. And uh, most of the most of the um, the funds goes to my uh, project, which I'm studying in Sierra Leone, and I've been doing it quite a long time now. St uh, doing uh, gathering uh, funds and uh, donations, sending them to Sierra Leone. Go there. I try to go there every uh, once a year when I collect a lot of stuff and then ship them over and then go there and donate them myself because I don't trust people anymore because I see those corrupt corruption in the camp when I was there and I just don't trust anybody, not even my own family. I don't trust them because they might sell them and you know, so sometimes not everybody can trust. So um, as I said, Every single penny that you put or you help, trust me, don't think that you're just going to throw it off the river. It's not going to go off the river. It's going to go to people. The family in Sierra Leone today live less than a dollar a day. And it's, it's very terrible over there. It's very terrible. The rich becoming more richer, the poor becoming more poor. And it's just terrible when you go there. Right now, one bag, 40 kilo of rice almost fifty dollars and just think about it if you don't have the money if your parents don't have work job it just depend on begging on the streets every day what do you think is going to happen to those people and they're still suffering they need our help and this is the only help i can offer them by gathering you know donations from generous people like you guys you know to help them get something and i hope that you won't think that Whatever you give will go to waste. It's not going to go to waste. And uh, I'm going to open now to questions. And uh, I hope that. No? Question? One? Oh, no. One question. All right. Okay. Just one question we have. Lucky. Lucky you. Pardon me? I can't. Oh, how many people still display in Sierra Leone? Uh, are they uh, displaced? Yeah, there's so there's still a few. Oh. There's still a few. There's still there's still a few camps, and uh, there's there's still the Arpentis and the war wounded, which for me I think, what. Thank you. Sorry. Oh, oh no.